I would just like to give a very big thank you to my tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Feudic Joel, German Chemist, and Casper Amholtz. Thank you again very much. Story Double One Synthetic Destiny Written by Rosie013 Lalt glanced down on the human corpse with content. Another thread cut, one more strand closer to this tapestry of victory over the upright vermin that smoked this world. He checked the feed from the splinter rifle, 40% ammunition remaining to be dispensed, 70% battery pack charge to do it that with. Enough for now. The crude projectile weapons they pelted him with wasn't even enough to scratch the paint in his battle harness, so Lalt didn't even bother to check its condition. Just as he made to move out, a glint of a reflection beneath him caught his attention. The body had something shiny on it, totally out of place on the battlefield. It was glass, or more specifically, two bits of glass over its eyes. Simple vision enhancers, Primitive and unimpressive, but a sign that the infestation was more than just producing weapons, but enhancements too. Irrelevant, their threats would be cut regardless. He strode forward, his weight driving the head of the already forgotten corpse into the mud. The dead vermin he shared a foxhole with stared at him balefully. Blout stared back, waiting for a gap in the bombardment. The human slug throwers might be ineffectual on this individual level, but the big guns might cause some damage to his harness. Unacceptable. Better to wait for them to cease this bombardment before continuing his cleansing. Even now, he could feel the occasional nearby thread snap in his mind as one of their own perished to the indirect fire. Brave of them to think that this would do anything other than slow him and his many brothers down. There was no stopping it out. The tapestry had been started and would be woven until complete. The rest, however, did give him time to inspect the changes to his foe. It was a ratty-looking thing, even in death. Its gear was subtly different too. Armor more form-fitting, projectile weapon more compact. But most interesting was its left arm. A crude prosthetic, not even motorized, but enough to grip its gun. Before he could consider the deeper implications of this, the bombardment stopped and Lalt rose to continue with his purpose. Lalt ignored the droning of the intelligence representative and stared at the human cadaver on the table between them. His harness was freshly repaired and repainted, his splinter rifle charged at full capacity, ready to head back to the front when he had been directed to this meeting by some of the hive's workers. The dead vermin looked like any other, save for an artificial ocular implant built right into the creature's head. It was nonetheless crude, rushed work. The intelligence drone was wrong. It didn't matter if it was simple vision enhancement or targeting equipment. The vermin's thread would be cut like any others of its kind that dared to exist. They might have learned to resist, but it would be utterly futile. The fact that he was already dead was proof enough. The upright vermin died as the last of the rifle's ammunition shredded its chest, but not with the usual gargling scream that Lult had come to expect. Instead, there was a loud hiss as escaping gases emerged from the ruptured metal and plastic organs in its torso cavity. Lult might have not been sure if it was even dead if it wasn't for the snapping of its thread in the back of his mind. The cleansing had been slow of late, the tapestry of victory slowing to a worker drone's crawling pace. The vermin's new laser guns were contributing heavily to that. They could actually kill his kind with a lucky shot, as a few of his less fortunate brothers could attest. He looked back at the cooling remains of his defeated foe. He hadn't seen internal modifications amongst his foe before. Lult, which just considering what that meant for the extermination when the remains exploded, engulfing him in a small but intense fireball. 
He reported to the intelligence briefing just before it began. The need for the rest of the temporary hive bunk that had been offered to him felt way more pressing. Where once he would have just jostled for position, now there was space for himself and all of his brothers, all that remained now. On the table before the drone was a dead human, or part of one, anyway. The question was, which part? Whatever artificial limb I had originally replaced was irrelevant, however, as the inbuilt laser weapon was considerably great concern. Lot had heard rumors of this. The humans were now incorporating the lasers of war directly into themselves, rather than carry them as equipment. It was astonishing to see it himself. The sense of nervousness of his brothers indicated that they shared his feelings. This was a direct affront to the tapestry of life, the merging of individuals and tools. It was just wrong. They deserved their deaths, and for all this wrong that they had done. Something was wrong. The human soldier in front of him was dead, but not dead. Lalt had emptied his splinter rifle into it ineffectually before resorting to tearing it apart with his mandibles. It lay on the ground in front of it, twisted apart and unmoving as only the dead could be. It wasn't going to explode. They had given up on that trick some time ago. His forelimbs subconsciously brushed against his carapace, where he was still discolored from burn scars. He quickly scanned the data frequencies. No distress signal of the injured human was present, at least on this part of the battlefield. The tapestry was... what? There had been no snap of the thread being cut, nothing to signal a life form had moved on. No death. The body was dead, but there had been no death. Quickly, Lout tore apart the remains, looking for the meat of the creature under all the augmentations. Nothing. Whatever he had just killed, it wasn't human vermin like he had first faced when Evive came to this world. He wasn't sure what it was. And for the first time in his life, he felt fear. Josh AI-027 binary code did not pause his advance to take note of the latest insect soldier to fall to his repeated laser cannons. He did not care that it was one of the oldest beings the hive had on the planet, one of the few remaining who came from off-world at the beginning of the invasion, all those years ago. He did not care about its outdated weapons and armor harness, he did not care about its many battle scars and senior carapace markings. He did not care that the hive heard its string snap as the victory tapestry continued to unravel. He calmly and uncaringly added another kill to his tally and ground Lout's body into the mud beneath his tracks. End of story. Story number two. Harry and the Food Replicator Safety Protocols, written by Warp Mind. Human Harry, I received reports that you've tampered with the Food Replicator and endangered your crew members. Harry sighed, looking up at the Kuthulk, whose three eyes all stared at him sternly. Sorry, Captain. I admit fault in forgetting to re-enable the safety protocols after getting breakfast. Uh, it was unintentional, and I'm relieved that no one was harmed as a result. Kuthulk looked down at the report, the middle eyebrow coding in uh, concern, frustration. Harry had some trouble reading the captain's facial mimicry, even if the Kulithak were amongst the most human-like species on board. The three eyes, run-facing and independent of one another, weirded him out. Human Harry, I am seriously concerned disabling the safety protocols to begin with is a severe breach of, uh, well, um, all regulations. Really, um, will someone could poison themselves or make narcotics. I've checked the human nutritional requirements. The standard restrictions don't block any of your sustenances that your species needs whatsoever. So I can't find any justification for your actions to, uh, what's the earth and saying, um, brush this under the carpet, something of the sort. Harry smiled wryly. Sweep it under the rug, sir. Uh, I know. I know, um, but the thing is, uh, food made with the security protocols engaged just, um, uh, doesn't taste anything, uh, like anything at all. 
Plus, uh, there are other things I liked that the protocols won't allow at all. And in my defense, sir, I did lock my special menu options to my own biometric protocol. So, um, it's not as though someone else could accidentally order it. Quilthuk shook his head slowly, imitating the human gesture. No, um, I can't simply accept that explanation, but I will give you the opportunity to show me. Show me that you can indeed not replicate your sustenance with the protocols active, and I will see what I can do about adjusting them. Harry sighed softly as the disabled protocols and made his drink, took the cup out of the replicator, and enabled the security protocols again before ordering the same thing. Then he took a step back. Kulthuk looked quizzically, or so Harry thought, at the back battle, and quickly followed suit. Then there was a loud, sharp explosion from the food replicator, and a bit of smoke came out, accompanied by a printer error message for the engineer who would have to diagnose and repair the machine. The captain carefully read the printout, all three eyebrows rising, and his gills turning a sickly shade of cyan. But this can't be right. Caffeine, capsaicin, cuberin, lactose, theobromine, all in concentrations that would cause either immediate or gradual organ failures. These dosages can't be... What in the name of the 16-star cluster is the thing you're drinking, human Harry? Harry took a slow, delighted sip of his cup, savoring the rich flavors. It's um, called a Mexican spiced mocha, and I don't rightly get through the day without a cup or three. Kulthuk stood there as Harry sipped his coffee, looking at the printout to the cup, mentally calculating the sheer amount of toxins the human before him was processing on a daily basis, and fainted. He came to in the med bay, slowly opening one eye at a time, seeing Harry wobbling out of the door with some apparent intestinal discomfort, and turned his head to stare at the ceiling. So the human was apparently trying to show off, after all, and now he paid the price for that toxic cocktail of his. He turned his head slightly as Dr. Merm's shadow fell on him. Ah, doctor, how long? The Merm shrugged with his lower arms, the common gesture of relief of the Hawassi. Long enough that I was getting concerned, Captain. A little over three standard hours. You hit your head a bit hard when you fell, though the circumstances seem a bit, um, unusual. Human Harry said that you just, uh, fainted. Kulthuk frowned. I, uh, the, the list of poisons Human Harry bragged about consuming on a regular basis. I see now that he was putting on a brave face to avoid punishment for endangering the rest of the crew. I gather he came by to get some treatment for that Mexican spiced mocha, as he called it. Moon shook his head. Normally, I would not answer that, but given the circumstances, no, he did not. He just came by for an antacid pill, complaining that since he was locked out of the security protocols, he couldn't get his food seasoned the way he likes. Kothk arched his two eyebrows, and that gave him acid problems. Mern shook his head again, scratching the top of his head. No, uh, the half a canister of riot control spray he poured on his steak and tumors did. He said something about it being deceptively sweet. He might be a little insane. E even for a human? Kulthuk fainted again. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed.